I'm John Warren, the Director of Admissions and Tuition Assistance here at Columbus Academy. Um, and just a little bit about our Zoom at Noon program. This is our inaugural one for the 2021-22 school year, looking at admissions for 22-23. So welcome. And uh, we've got a number of different topics coming up. Mondays at noon are, are the, uh, the bat time, same bat time, same bat channel. So we are going to uh, have some, some information about lower school sports, about our performing arts program, about our STEM program here. Um, actually, STEAM would be, would be better uh, termed. Um, so uh, soup to nuts. Uh, if you can join us for every single one, we'd love to have you. Uh, if you want to pick and choose, uh, obviously, that's a, an option as well. So oh, we're very excited. Um, the admissions office is convinced uh, that Columbus Academy's got so much going on, so many things happening here, that uh, the more you hear about what's happening here, the more you want to join our community. So today, uh, to kick off the, the season, uh, Melissa Soderberg, our head of school uh, in her ninth year here at Columbus Academy, is joining us. And we're going to talk about the, the philosophy and the reality that is uh, what goes on with independent schools. Uh, Columbus has a few different independent schools, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, we are, you, people are understanding what that, what that really means, the nomenclature independent. So welcome, Melissa, a little bio, a little self bio, yep. please uh, introduce myself. So hi, I uh, moved to Columbus from Minneapolis, and I've been here nine years. My husband teaches uh, archaeology, actually at a at a local um, private college. And um, I have two sons who are in college who are both graduates from Columbus Academy. So I've had uh, a lot of experience here being um, being a parent as well. And I thought I'd tell a quick story about our experience as parents, particularly when our children were very young, um, being private school parents. Um, and a lot of our friends were public school parents. And when they were, when our kids were in lower school around second through fourth grade, we had a group of friends and we'd get together uh, and have dinners and our children would play. And uh, we started to notice that our friends who were going to really strong public schools in Minneapolis were constantly talking about what reading group their children were in. They were talking about issues that they were having um, in the, in the uh, uh, school in terms of trying to figure out if the school was paying attention to every detail about their child's learning. And my husband and I noticed this pattern of we were ne we never had anything to add to these conversations because we were at a school, um, like all independent schools, that has a very small number of students per teacher, but also is dedicated to understanding how to grow children and, and feel some ownership in having them in the school all the way through their career. And uh, it's something that we noticed that was really, really dramatically different from what our friends experienced in, um, in the public schools. So what I wanted to say is that I think from the outside, uh, private schools and independent schools, particularly independent schools are they're not attached to any religion um, and they, uh, they act independently in their curriculum. Uh, they look like places that are kind of, uh, you know, kind of big and, and fancy and they, and kids dress differently for school. But all of the things that are structured about how we operate, small class sizes, certain kind of innovative curriculum, it's all around our mission. It's all, um, all those things are derived out of how we conceive uh, the best education for children and then how we talk about it and how we manifest that through lots of um, so through lots of ways that uh, we hold school every day. So our upper schoolers um, come in to school and they shake the hands of faculty members and that's how they check in, um, which is markedly different than um, some of the schools that I drive by on my way to work, which kids are kind of wandering in and out of the local gas station to get things to eat. And then they're kind of uh, standing outside waiting to be uh, pass a, a number of police before they kind of get inside. So it's, it's a very interesting and different um, experience. Our mission 
is to, you know, broadly is to have, care about the character and values that a student develops of honesty and integrity and compassion. It is to expect um, our students to act with, um, with integrity and to be scholars in their own right. So we talk about a rigorous academic curriculum in our mission. And then finally, um, or actually both first and last in the way our mission statement reads, we care tremendously about a diversity of students. And we have a wide range of students in terms of ethnic diversity and diversity by zip code. Nancy, can you put up the slide, please? Um, around the city. And this year we have about 40, 40% 40 uh, 43, 43 43 students who are not white in our school. And we're proud of how diverse it is. And we, um, and we also care about training students, um, everything we do in our curriculum from three-year-olds up through grade 12 is to develop confident citizens who are ready for a pluralistic world. And we think that's an incredibly important feature of, um, of what we do. So those are the basic tenets of how we organize our school. It's not organized around a location. Um, public schools are organized around neighborhoods or um, cities and ours is organized around a set of values which are written in our mission statement. That's great. Um, so as, as you think about, uh, Melissa, are you, you interviewing me? Yes, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, it's a little I'm odd. in my office and this is student artwork. Yeah. So this is a, a, a boy who was a sophomore at the time. He painted that actually in his basement during the pandemic while he was working with our um, one of our art teachers. So, so um, in any case, um, Melissa, talk a little bit, if you would, about you know, the, the differences in, um, you know, there's so many differences, but, you know, there's differences in financing, there's differences in yeah. curriculum, there's difference in pedagogy, um, you know, a little bit about some of those, how, how it appears on the ground. So we're structured really similarly to a small college. Um, and we have uh, important constituents. We have all the students and the parents. Our alumni are important constituents as well. Um, we uh, have uh, a, a board of trustees, which is exactly like um, a college would have. And the board of trustees is really charged with making sure that the institution will be functioning really well in the next 50 years. And so uh, they have a very broad perspective on making sure that it has um, enough money, but it has it's continuing to follow its mission and they are stewards of the school. So, so they don't get involved in the day to day. They don't get it. They don't, although I, I in their one employee is me. And um, I talk to them a lot about the day to day aspect very similarly to a college president would to to his or her board but um but they don't make decisions on day-to-day -day aspects um financing is really interesting we charge tuition uh we charge tuition because we don't get any money from the state except for a small amount per child that we get um that's that's just part of what the state of ohio does um and so we are tuition driven. And one of the interesting pieces is that it's a kind of check and balance figure. So people either feel that we're worth what, um, what we need them to pay to be able to provide the kind of education that we've designed, or they don't. And we find that being in that private marketplace um, really helps us stay attuned to uh, what are the most important aspects of, of what we do. Um, because you can, you can walk away from, um, from our school easily and, and go to um, your local public school and, and not pay anything. So we uh, work very hard to be worth um, every dime that that uh, that people pay to come here. We also make it possible and care tremendously about making it possible for people who um, find that this might be a very expensive proposition. We want to be able to afford those students to come to who uh, we think would be a great addition to to our student body, so we yeah uh, uh, we work hard at that. The director of admissions adds that uh, we've got twenty five percent roughly of our students on need based tuition assistance, um, and those those uh, tuition 
assistance grants are about they, they're roughly half tuition on average. Um, we're, we are we're very proud that uh, we're pretty sure that our tuition assistance budget is the the largest in the city. Um, we we want to make Columbus Academy as affordable for everyone um, as it can be. Anyone who buys into the the mission of the school. So I was going to add some things about teaching faculty. So we have excellent teaching faculty, but I would never say that our teaching faculty are better than faculty who may be in a public school system. What ends up happening, though, is that our teaching faculty are expected to have a little bit different emphasis on certain things and the school itself is created to make it a, a wonderful place to teach. And so that that attracts and keeps really, really excellent faculty. So it isn't that our faculty are actually that different, it's just that the pressures on them are very different um, and the expectations are different. And uh, so we hire faculty who are excellent in their and their knowledge of the subject that they're teaching. In lower school, their licensure uh, around particularly reading and certain aspects, certificates in reading, those things are important, but we don't require state teaching licenses because we often in middle and upper school will have faculty with PhDs who are really amazing at um, their knowledge in biology or in Spanish or something like that, but they, um, but they love children and they don't have a teaching license because they've been teaching um, um, at uh, colleges and universities, or they've been teaching uh, at other private schools. So we, um, we work hard to get top teaching faculty, and then we give them a tremendous amount of support with excellent um, professional development money, both individually and uh, that, they can, that they can use, and also uh, that they can influence others in their department. And then we, uh, we also... Uh, have small class sizes, and our expectation is that our faculty are going to fully uh, develop in the lives of the of the students who are here, and really get to know them and and become part of the life of the school. And so, uh, it's just a different atmosphere. And in many ways, faculty who come work with us, who come from a public system, uh, they they just want to stay because it um, it's a it's a smaller scale operation, and um, and we don't do. Uh, state testing, and they are allowed to have a lot of autonomy and curricular design um, that the school itself um, certainly cares about and controls, but um, they're, they, they're the experts in the field and they can um, really influence how um, our curriculum becomes more creative. Consequently, we have really excellent curriculum and our students feel particularly enlivened by faculty who are doing their own research and, and dedicating their time to developing their own curriculum. Yeah, um, what I would add is, is Melissa's right. Uh, teachers come here and they, they think they've died and gone to teacher heaven. Um, you know, if you need anything for your classroom, you just go to your division head and say, I really need this and, and it, it's gonna happen. Um, the other thing is that uh, those same faculty uh, they end up really connecting with with children um, and their students. Um, there, are, I'm an alum, and there are about ten of us uh, who are back teaching at the school. And what brings it, what what motivated all of us to come back is the deep, meaningful relationships that we had with our faculty and coaches and mentors. So. Um, Melissa, maybe just hit a little bit more on on uh, funding, if you would. You know, we, we've got obviously you you mentioned that we're tuition driven. Um, that that pays for lots of it, but um, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mentioned we do have a question in the chat. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, great. Good. Uh, is the class mainly in the lecture format or mainly discussion format? Oh, that's a great one. Uh, well, that's interesting. So, um, so. Uh, wow, we we teach we have so many grades, right? So we have from three year olds through grade twelve, and and 
yeah, so 15 different grades and lots of different age groups. In the upper school, where it would be the only time that something would ever be in a lecture format, sure, you'd have a few things that are in lecture format. We have some really excellent um, lecturers, but those teachers also do things in discussion format and, um, and, and tend to really want to hear students develop their own voices in their subject and in the, in the um, class that they're in. So one of the principal characteristics of our um, curriculum from uh, the youngest kids to um, to seniors is that we expect them to be able to express themselves well, both in writing and in speaking. And every single aspect of the school develops that very, very carefully. It's a time consuming thing. It's why you need to have fewer students in a in a um, in a class. And our faculty love our students and love hearing what they have to say and getting into rich debates. So, um, but there are certainly some classes where we just need to get down to the brass tacks of how you're going to, um, you know, learn this these three concepts before we go into the chemistry lab, and that may be a lecture for about 25 minutes or so. Right. But it, but it is very, very active. Um, it, and if you haven't come out on campus, this gotta see it. you, you got to come around and, and take a look with us oh. um, and and you, you'll be you'll be blown away. Um, even classes um, when I was a student here, it, the lecture, all the classrooms were, were kind of identical. Uh, they were there. The desks were in rows and, uh, you know, it was what we call the sage on the stage, uh, the teacher being, you know, giving the pearls of wisdom uh, to, to the students. Um, now our math classes, um, and I, I was in the math discipline, our math classes um, are potted desks, you know, three or four desks that are, that are next to each other. And there's lots of discussion that's going on problem in, in problem solving yeah. and kids going up to the board, even in the upper school. Um, again, that's just not how how it used to happen. So um, I'm sure education is different everywhere, but um, but we, we have very, very active learning going on. I hope that answers the question. If, if there are any more questions, please do feel free to, to put them in the chat. Nancy's going to, to curate those for us. So John was asking about funding. And I think one of the key pieces is that when uh, people pay tuition, it's it's unlike a for-profit business. You know, in a for-profit business, if you pay for something, you're assuming that you're paying all sorts of other things, research and design, overhead, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, the vast majority of, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a big budget. We have a 32, $33 million budget this year, but um, the vast majority of the, the money that we get is from tuition. The vast majority of it goes out to faculty and staff salaries. Um, we don't hold money to pay for buildings and things like that. What ends up happening is that we happen to be a school that people uh, enjoy and love and after spending time here feel great loyalty to and they may give money later. So we have an outstanding campus but much of it has been afforded by people who are really trying to pay it forward after they've had a wonderful experience. They're trying to you know, make the school even more sustainable. So the school is a nonprofit entity and its board of trustees and governance structure is like all other nonprofit uh, boards. And we follow all the codes and regulations of nonprofit. The, the other piece that I, that um, Melissa, I was trying to get to you, yeah. get, get you to say, um, you know, some people think that if you, if you're paying tuition, that it's a kind of a transactional yeah, process no, no, no. and, and it, it, that, yeah. that's, that might be the impression. Can you talk about the transactional versus relational nature yeah, of, the so food, of the school? That's what yeah, I was trying to go We're for. not transactional at all. In fact, we're much less transactional than public schools, um, but that's probably because of scale more than anything. Um, we are totally relationship driven. So I would say that the most important things and the things we put a premium on are students' relationships relationships with their teachers and the school's relationships with families in the school. And relationships, um, when you feel close to something and when you feel like you belong, you, you get to, you know, you can argue. It's like being in a family. You can argue with your family and yet you also want to belong to your family. And it's all those ways of being. We work um, very intensely with parents trying to understand what they see at home.
home with behaviors in their child or how their children are learning. And we really want to hear um, how their children's experience on our campus um, and with individual teachers or individual classes is playing out for them. And we work really hard to pay attention to all those details. And we're constantly in conversation with families. So it's it's not through some arbitrary reporting structure and um, and much more conversational. Um, Melissa, uh, do, are, Nancy, are there any questions right now? Um, no more as of this moment. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting here. But um, Melissa, how about, how about some of the challenges facing independent schools uh, these days? Again, there are there are some out there. Yeah, I mean, one of the challenges is that, of course, we keep getting more expensive, like college. So that's uh, an issue, and we work very hard to make sure that uh, we mitigate our costs um, in the way best ways you can. But you're you're probably trying to drive a specific. No, well, no, I, I was thinking about you know looking for faculty, you know, trying, yeah. trying to find faculty, you know, making sure that we're we're accessible to all. That that's that's part of the. Cost yeah, I structure. think we um, we. Uh, work very, very hard to be as good a school as we can be. And that um, has its challenges in and of itself, because uh, there's a lot in the world that would say that it's much easier to do things on a bigger scale. Um, it's cheaper. It's more efficient. Um, and, you know, why why not just, you know, teach things very efficiently and, and kind of train students to be um, to be ready to just do a job as opposed to be ready to go to college. And we're very college oriented and it's a complex um, enterprise to put kids all together in what, you know, care about their emotional well being, their physical well being, and, um, and certainly their brains. And that's, you know, that's what we do. Those are the three things we pay most attention to our um, body, mind, and character. And uh, we tend to all of them all the time. Sometimes um, in, in different school systems, uh, you know, the arts or theater will get cut because it's so expensive. We actually, right at the time that arts were being cut out of the local public schools that, um, that are in our area, we, we dedicated an entire building to the arts and created an art gallery. We care so much about the various ways students can learn and express themselves. And we believe it fully that as, as important as math, science, um, and, and you know, writing and expressing in yourself are and history, the arts, being able to perform, being able to speak, learning, um, um, learning about drawing and having those sensi sensibilities about what's beautiful in the world are as important as anything else. So it sounds actually like a liberal arts education. It does. If I might, yes. <laughs> it is. But I think liberal arts has just become such a strange thing now because um, people don't understand. You know, the liberal end of liberal arts is about being free. It's a concept of freedom as opposed to a political concept. Well, what and what I what I can add. Uh, in terms of what Melissa's mentioning. Um, one of my sons, actually two of my sons are engineers. And uh, so when they went off to, to college, they didn't get to take any more art classes. And both of them, one was very big into the performing arts here. One of them was very big into ceramics. And th these experiences in high school end up, it, mm -hmm. and I didn't even think about it at the time. Yeah, and I actually- one, Now one's a creative yes, designer. Yeah, yeah, he's actually in the, <laughs> on GM's innovation team. Yeah. So um, so get, getting to that creative creativity mm -hmm. piece. But, you know, as, as students are, they, these may be some of their, their limiting experiences in terms of uh, what they go off and major in. So, so the, the liberal arts piece is, is very good. Um, I might also add that, um, that sometimes the best um, way to find out whether a school is a good fit or why an independent school might be a better fit than another choice uh, is to talk to people who have their children in college who have, who have gone through the whole enterprise. And I would say that both my sons in college find that they are so much better prepared than their um, 
their fellow students, even some from other private schools, from Catholic schools and stuff, but they're so much better prepared, not only academically, but to kind of get in front of teachers and, and figure out that kind of social currency of how you go to an office hour, chat with the teacher, talk about things that you're interested in. And it's just, uh, it's just a, a wonderful education. You steeped in it for 15 years at this school if you come from the very beginning and you just go to college completely ready to take advantage of, uh, of everything that's being offered. I heard you say that body, mind, and character are three focal points for Columbus Academy education. Can you talk more about the opportunities to participate <laughs> in sports? Absolutely. <laughs> Competitive sports and non-competitive movement sports. Do you want to talk a, sure. a little bit about that? Sure. Um, what, what, one of the one of the hallmarks of Columbus Academy is actually the fact that we we are able to. So many things are important to us. Basically, whatever the interests of the children are, become important to the school, and so our uh, both our competitive uh, sports program, we we have uh, starting actually in the. Uh, middle school is when we have interscholastic sports, sixth grade and up. And, and particularly early in that experience, the emphasis is not on winning. We are about instruction. We're about, you know, learning as much as you can from being on a team. Um, the idea of progressing and, uh, and dedicating to something bigger than just yourself. It's the same idea as our service program, actually. Um, and so uh, it moves up and in the high school, we are we are quite competitive. Uh, a few years ago, we were actually uh, ranked in the top five in the state in terms of where we, how our sports teams overall added up. Um, there's uh, some some uh, computer nerd gave point values to each of these uh, each sport, interscholastic sport, and tallied them up. Um, in any case. Um, we, we, it will vary a little bit year to year sometimes, but uh, this past year, our <laughs> boys golf team yeah. actually five peated. That's not varying much year to yeah, year. Fifth in a row. Fifth one in state. a row. Um, girls golf team in their third year of existence uh, made, it to, made it to states and was fourth in the, in the state. Uh, our girls tennis team just uh finished their season third in the state. Uh, our football team is, has done very, very well. Uh, boys and girls soccer. Cross country. Cross country. Um, we, we have a we have probably the largest number of, we, we compete with like two other schools in the state of Ohio for the largest number of sports per capita. And so what is interesting for us is it's everything in this school is a balance, a balance of participation, and then a, a balance of participation, but also achievement. So we, we want to create a, a laboratory where you can run for cross country and then decide you don't like it and go out for, you know, JV football and you can, you know, so we want that, but we also want our teams to really excel and we work very hard at the tension of those two things. And uh, we have teams each, um, each uh, season that will take all comers and cross country takes anybody. You don't get cut from cross country and you can run and you can develop your skills. And it, often we will see kids take, take on swimming and they never knew they loved it. Right. Or they take on running and they ne or track and they never knew that they could you know, throw a discus. So we are very proud of both the records of our you know, achievement. Team, uh, achievement and our how strong our teams are, but we really, really enjoy um, making sure that our kids participate. Right. Two two quick additions, if I could. Um, one, you mentioned non-competitive sports. Um, in the in the lower school, we actually uh, now have an, an assistant athletic director for uh, lower school sports, yeah, youth sports, youth, yeah. for youth sports, and and uh, Ms. Deed's whole role is. At the instructional level, and again, we're trying to find that balance between we don't want to go ahead and have uh, you know a third grader learning how to play a sport and go, gosh, I gotta win, gotta win, gotta win, and all that sort of stuff. But we want them to understand all the good things and get and and make that make that that practice happen. Um, I was going to go someplace else that I've forgotten and won't go to. Okay, so we have another <laughs> question about can we describe service? Oh. So service is. Um, 
is a really important piece of what we do. And we have some service in the lower and middle schools and students who sing might go to a um, retirement home and they might make cards, holiday cards with individuals. And we make sure that that's happening and uh, that's part of like a class initiative. We do some service through athletic teams. We also do really comprehensive service in upper school. Each grade does service. We have service day. We ask students to go do service on their own. All of it is a form of community engagement. We don't call it volunteer because there's nothing really volunteer about it. We're actually asking you to develop the skills and the attitude and the knowledge of being out among people um, and working with them, not necessarily coming to help, but working with them and getting to know them. And they might be from a totally different walk of life or a different neighborhood you've never been in. And um, the most important thing is to be able to develop those skills of how to how to be with uh, with people who are who are all very different. And so um, our service program is quite comprehensive. It is a major piece of our um, of our strategic vision. And it will grow even more so in the future, um, in the future years for the school, more in kind of its expansion through the divisions and also its outreach into the community. Coding and science. Oh, okay. Um, we, we have a very comprehensive coding um, and uh, let me talk about coding first and then maybe science. Um, we actually have, if uh, any of your children have ever used a program called Scratch, um, our lead computer science teacher, David Feinberg, uh, is one of the co-authors of this program. Routinely, as I'm out of MIT, out of MIT, um, it, it's a worldwide use used uh, kind of baby programming language. Um, and so I'll be touring a family and just mention, you ever use Scratch? And the kid goes, Oh yeah, sure. That was a long time ago, but um, and we get to introduce them to, to David Feinberg. We have three uh, computer science teachers in the upper school. I'm not, they aren't all full-time, but we have about uh, between 30 and 40%. It's, it's reaching about 40% mm -hmm. per year uh, of our upper school student body take an elective at uh, an elective computer science course. Last year, this is, I'm going to steal the, steal the, the your thunder. Last year, uh, Columbus Academy students um, took 4% of all of the AP computer science advanced placement tests in the state of Ohio. Um, and and did, we have a high number of It did girls. very well. Yes. We actually have a girl among us who, um, at this year's senior class, who got a five on computer science, and she got a five in English. And there are only, and she's African, she's black. I'm not sure she's African American. She identifies as black. She, there are only 64 students in the world who have gotten a five in English and a five in computer science. And she's absolutely brilliant and she's with us. So we are very proud of our female participation, our diverse participation in something like computer science, which as a, as a department or as kind of an, even an industry struggles a little bit with that. Yeah, and uh, and science same sort of same same sort of results, um, and and again it builds as it's going through. Um, I, we, science has a high degree of PhD faculty, and it just happens to be that I think that they decided they didn't want to go teach at OSU, so they they not all of them, but they uh, they come. Yeah, and 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 it's very exploratory. Uh, the science program, um, we we have Forest Fridays for our, our youngest students, and the kids are getting out and exploring. And part of that is um, physical in nature, but but part of it is also it's very student driven. You know, exploring what happens if mm -hmm. we do this, and you know, we walk this yeah. way, and again, moving all the way through. Um, so it so it's very investigative uh, at the at the lower levels particularly um, and even at the upper, upper levels. Um, I, in order to prepare for an AP, you do have to do some some lectures. 
but uh, there'll be there'll be lots of labs. And we have we've really diversified our science curriculum. So we have multiple ways to attack physics. You can go kind of in the super kind of molecular level, and then you can robotics. look at it in uh, more yeah more robotics, more functioning. Um, we also have uh, lots of different ways to tackle biology. So we have environmental ends of biology. We have molecular levels of biology. So it's a uh, it's actually just um, uh, a really wide uh, curriculum, and that's kind of what's expensive, right? We offer a lot of things to really develop um, every student and their interests, and you know we don't do it um, necessarily on a scale that's tremendously efficient, and so um, expensive in that way. But it's what we think is the right thing to do. Um, any last questions? Uh, we can take take one or two more perhaps, but we wanna make sure that we're respectful of your time and trying to get finished by 12.45. Um, oh, I, I did remember um, about the, the sports. One of um, someone, had the, going back to the, to the question of uh, talk about competitive sports. One of the interesting things, I, I was touring a, a student uh, earlier, uh, late last week, and the student um, wanted to, uh, to participate in football here. Um, and, uh, you know, as we were walking, he also, we walked by our, our field house and there were, there were some kids playing basketball. And he goes, Oh, I, I used to play basketball. And, you know, at a small school like Columbus Academy, you actually can do multiple sports. Um, and, and he just assumed, um, coming out of his, his large, uh, school that he was going to have to specialize and just do this one right. sport. And we routinely have students yeah. who excel at, at more yep. than one item. So. What percentage of graduates? That's an interesting question. That makes it, that, that sounds more transactional than relational. If I can, if I can edit, um, do you want to take, you, yeah, I, mean, I used mid, to be a college yes, counselor. That's, so, um, we actually don't, I mean, you can look at our colleges, you just Google online, you take a look at the college profile. So if you Google Columbus Academy college profile, you'll see, but we don't actually list things like that. And there's a variety of reasons why it's, it might sound evasive, but the, um, the reason is that we have lots of students apply to Ivy League colleges and we have lots of students who may choose not to attend them because of cost or other things. Um, we have students who will get into Ivy League colleges for all sorts of reasons, right? So, um, so, but we have an, a robust college counseling um, office. We have really some of the most excellent college counselors in the country. I know that because when I'm with other heads of school from independent schools around the country, they all know who uh, Darnell and Jen <laughs> are. And, um, and they uh, will often say, wow, you, you've got quite a team. Part of that is that uh, they've served on many boards. Uh, most recently, Darnell served on the college board, which writes the SAT and produces the common application. and or actually help start the common application and does APs and Darnell served on the admissions and testing committee. So she was basically working to establish a mis admissions practices with the college board. So uh, we have an excellent list. I know the college counselors would be happy to talk with anybody about, um, about Ivy League. I can tell you that in terms of you just want raw data about things, we're pretty proud this year um, our national merit semifinalists uh, list came out. We had 19 national merit semifinalists, and uh, that is the highest number um, for that's the highest percentage in any high school in the state of Ohio. Um, so we, you know, there are other couple other schools that had about 30, but they have about 2,000 to 3,000 high school students, and we had 19, and we have just around 400 high school students. So we're, we're proud of that and gives you a sense of the competitiveness of our classes. And, and the thing that I would add about, about our college, uh, the, the college. It's a match to be made, list. not a prize to be won. Yes. And, and the idea is um, we, we go through this process with, with our students, the, the college counseling office. We have three full-time college counselors for 
uh, uh, just over 100 uh, students in our senior class. So the ratio is, again, very, very small. And, and we end up being able to, to really coach these, these students and families. Um, so the, the idea is we really are trying to find a match. There are lots of, of students who come in uh, to, to be tour, take a tour, and they say, oh, I really want to go to school X. I, you know, I saw a Duke basketball game when I was little, and ever since then, I've wanted to be one of the Cameron crazies. Um, and that's it. That's fascinating. We all, we all want students to achieve whatever they, whatever they desire. But the interesting thing is many of these students, you know, they think that there's one school out there for them. There are, I, I think it's like 3,200 colleges and universities in, in the States. That's not even including international. There are multiple schools that will serve our children very, very well. Um, and, and again, it, we're not trying to duck the question. Last thing I'd say is um, we had those 19 semifinalists. Um, I can add, we can add on 12 more who were recognized yeah. by college board. For commended students. For yeah. com commended students as well. So um, that's out of a class of 112, 111, yeah. 112. Um, it's really strong. It's over a quarter of our students. That's yeah. pretty amazing. <laughs> You can we can match those numbers to any place else you're looking. Yeah, go, <laughs> we're, go ahead. We're happy to have you do. Um, let's see. Can students take multiple languages? Absolutely. I think what ends up happening is that we have students who have so many interests that they they may start on the double language track and then they discover that they might rather take various forms of other things. So you, students do and can um, take multiple languages in, uh, in high school, um, but they, uh, they often step away from it after originally thinking that that was what they wanted to do. And I think that's just, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, for smaller private schools, it's a really good way to show that a student is strong by having them take multiple languages. But for a big, um, bigger private school like us, where we have lots of options of things you can take, often students steer away from it. But we are very proud of our languages. We teach, um, we teach uh, Chinese and Spanish, and we have a Latin as a major player uh, in the middle and upper schools. And we start with Spanish at the earliest grades. So. Okay. If there are any, any other questions or things that, um, reasons that you wonder about you know, reasons you might not want to send your ch children or you might not want to come mm. visit, please write them in and we, we'd be happy to talk with you about it. Okay, one time for one more. Um, I think that's it. Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we very much appreciate it. And uh, please consider this an invitation yeah. to come uh, out to Columbus Academy and uh, and take a look at, at what we're doing. Um, so many people have a have a misperception. They assume our kids are very stressed out, that they are incredibly, uh, you know, kind of ma machined. Uh, you, you'll find that it's nothing like that at all. They're playing out in our quadrangle outside my office all the time. Yeah. Badminton, <laughs> wiffle Fris ball, frisbee, frisbee and during their free spike time. ball. Yeah. Um, so um, you might mention, oh, thank you very much. Uh, we do also have Viking visits coming up. Um, uh, uh, Tuesday mornings uh, at 8.30 are group tours for the lower school during up until December. Um, it starts next week. Uh, no, on Thursdays are middle and upper school group tours. Um, you're always welcome to schedule an, indi an individual tour. Um, no children on the on the group tours, but uh, but on the independent on the uh, the individual tours, you you can uh, bring bring a, uh, your children. But um, we'd love to see you out here. Um, it's the best way to get a feeling for the school, and. Yeah, it really, it really, you'll get the gestalt, suddenly you get the, you get the whole sense of, of why, why people would want to come and why they'd want to take their really hard earned dollars and put it towards this kind of enterprise. If you have further questions, you can always uh, email them to admissions at columbusacademy.org, admissions at columbusacademy.org. Please reach out to us. We're happy to help. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>